Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 38. Start writing no matter what. The water does not flow until the faucet is turned on. Luis Lamord. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Today on the show, we have Eric Bort, screenwriter, producer, and author of the new book, The Idea, The Seven Elements of a Viable Story for Screen, Stage, or Fiction. Now, Eric has a very unique story in how he got into Hollywood, working uh, his way as runners on studio sets and and in, in the back lots as well. But but his real break came when he was assigned to Tom Hanks's production company as a runner. And from that point on, he became an assistant, then uh, moved on from there and was able to work with Tom Hanks on some amazing miniseries like HBO's Band of Brothers as well as From Earth to the Moon. We talk all about the craft, how to hone that idea that actually creates a good story and screenplay, and many, many other things. So please enjoy my conversation with Eric Bork. I'd like to welcome to the show Eric Bork, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you, man. So you've, 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 uh, you've lived a very interesting career in, in Hollyweird, uh, and your story is quite interesting from what I've been able to pick up online. So first off, how did you get into the business? Well, I moved to L.A. from Ohio, where I'd grown up and gone to film school, got a bachelor's degree in motion picture production, BFA, mm-hmm. from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Moved out to L.A., started working as an assistant, first as a temp. Mm-hmm. Worked around the Fox lot for a couple of years, including a writer's assistant job on the show Picket Fences, nice. David e. Kelly drama, which won the uh, Emmy for Best Drama that year and the next year. Uh, and eventually I kind of had paid my dues in the temp pool at Fox, the in-house temp pool where I'd be assigned to different sort of offices every day or every week or every month, whatever. Uh, and uh, they assigned me to Tom Hanks's production company. Tom had just moved onto the Fox lot. His deal had been at Disney. Uh, he only had his, his, his like main assistant and then me as the temp helping get the office set up. I thought I'd be there a month mm-hmm. at most. And then it turned into a full time assistant position and eventually led to my, you know, big break. Nice. And, uh, that, that must've been a fun boss. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I idolized him, you know, big was one of my favorite oh. movies. And when I started working for him, the week I started temping for him was the week that Sleepless in Seattle premiered. Oh, wow. And Philadelphia was already in the can, and he was about to go shoot Forrest Gump. So <laughs> during, the, during the two years that I worked as, as his like second assistant, he won the back-to-back Oscars. Wow. And it was like my job the day after the Oscars to take the statuette to the Academy Building and have his nameplate put on, because they don't do that the night of. At least they didn't then. Yeah. So I'm driving my beat-up Toyota Celica to the Academy Building with Tom Hanks' Oscar, Oscar. in the passenger seat. <laughs> Uh, that's the kind of stuff I got to do. Um, so it was cool being on the, in, you know, on the, in the inner, inner sort of circle as a, as an employee to him when he was at, 
you know, reached this incredible height. Oh, yeah. Which he's arguably never, you know, never gone down from that height because then it led to producing and all these other things, which I got to be involved in. Yeah, I mean, that must have been, uh, yeah, you were, you were there at like a really fun part of his career. <laughs> I yeah. mean, he was like, pow, 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 pow. Like everything he touched was gold. And is it true that he is as nice as they say he is? Yeah, he's very nice. He's very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Very can be cutting in his in his humor, but in a way that's entertaining. Like he would always make me laugh, uh, and he's extremely generous. the The opportunity he gives people uh, is amazing, including me. Um, and he sticks with people, and he's uh, he's just like a fun, easygoing guy for a big star like that. That you know, you would think there'd be you know tons of ego and insecurity and need to prove oneself or whatever the kind of stuff we might think that big actors might have. Yeah. He doesn't seem to have any of that. He's just like a happy-go-lucky guy that loves making things, loves acting and and uh, producing, and you know, just just into it. That's awesome. Now, how did you get involved with Band of Brothers? Well, first there was From the Earth to the Moon, which was the miniseries that that Tom executive produced for HBO Mm -hmm. in the late 90s. Uh, That's where my big break came in, which is that he gave me this promotion that enabled me to help him kind of ultimately write and produce that miniseries. Uh, There were steps along the way to that. But at the end of the day, I had a co-producer credit. I'd been involved in every aspect of it. I had multiple writing credits on the scripts. So Band of Brothers was kind of like a reteaming of a lot of the same people, plus adding Steven Spielberg as an executive producer. So so I was kind of already had done that sort of two to three year project with him before. And so Band of Brothers was like, Here's another one, kind of. Well, that let's, was my experience of it. Yeah. So then let's go back to for, uh, From Earth to the Moon, which it's one of my favorite miniseries. It was kind of like – I can't say it was the beginning of miniseries, but it was kind of this kind of beginning, if I remember correctly, kind of the beginning of this like HBO high production value kind of miniseries. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. I think it was the first one. Yeah. And they spent like $70 million and it was way over the top amount of money for them to spend at that time. Right. Now, and, now that's an episode uh, sure of Game of Thrones. Well, now that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm sure they were nervous, but that, that turned out to be a huge monster hit for HBO. Well, you know, HBO, it's not so much about ratings. Of course, it's about subscribers. And how do you get subscribers? You win awards and you have critics love it and have people think you got to have HBO in order to get this kind of programming. And so we won the all the Emmys and the big awards for miniseries, which I think was the most important thing at the end. Uh and uh, enabled them to go, okay, let's do more of these. And then Band of Brothers was like the next one. And, 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 on, and then on um, From Earth to the Moon, you were a writer or a producer or was, just a writer? Yeah, my, my ultimate credit was co-producer on all of it and writer on multiple episodes. Some I didn't get credit on, some I have shared credits, one I have sole credit. Um, so, yeah, I was there at the beginning you know, when it was just an idea and a book that we had the rights to that Tom had sold a pitch to HBO. Uh, And I, in the mean, while working as his second assistant, I was writing all the time and eventually turned from feature film writing to sitcom writing, believe it or not, and had written three spec episodes of sitcoms of that of that day. Three NBC shows, actually, of uh, Frasier, Mad About You and Friends. And eventually Tom ended up reading one or two of those because his first assistant kind of, I guess, knew I'd gotten an agent and, and was, you know, I uh, kind of became part of the inner circle by then. And she suggested that he read one or that I give him one, which I it was never going to be my idea to do that. Right. You know, it had to be somebody else. Right. So he did and pronounced me talented. And, and, uh, and then a few months later said, how would you like to stop being an assistant and like have your own assistant and, you know, like this life changing thing and help me figure out this mini series. So that led to us, uh, this is from the earth to the moon that led to us like kind of meeting for breakfasts mm-hmm. over the course of weeks and going over ideas for each episode and me kind of helping draft this like 50 page Bible for what the miniseries was going to be, which HBO approved. And then we used that to go get writers. And, uh, and it was also my job to help find writers like established writers to uh, write episodes of this. And along the way of doing that, one of the other producers that I was working with suggested maybe I should write one of the episodes. Again, it's not going to be me asking for it, but if someone else does, 
Yes, please. <laughs> so uh, then I was assigned or I chose one of the episodes that had not been assigned anybody and wrote a bazillion drafts of that, which were terrible for a long time because I was really in over my head and never tried to write historical drama. You know, I mean, trying to do justice to the real events and have everything be accurate. I was overly obsessed with the research and all that stuff. A lot of lessons I learned along the way. And um, but eventually under the tutelage of Tony Toe, who was our co-exec producer was like the day-to-day producer who kind of ran everything Mm -hmm. and oversaw the writers, the directors, everything as a like non-writing producer. Uh, I I found my way and my script became considered a decent one. And then I was asked to rewrite some of the other ones, which is how I have shared credit on some of the other ones. And And also, I'm sorry, working under Tony, I became his kind of like apprentice producer, like his, you know, shadow everywhere he went. So I got to be in all the big meetings and all be on set, be in the editing room, be involved in every aspect. And because I was also Tom's point person or the first kind of like employee one in a way, uh, not really, but close to that on the miniseries, I sort of had access and had, and had to be dealt with <laughs> to some extent, you know, so I could be on, <laughs> on the set, you know, whispering in Lily Zanuck or John Turtletaub or Sally Fields ear saying, I don't know if Tom would like this, you know, it'd be a real <laughs> annoying, you know, inexperienced young jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the ego might run away with you uh, at that at that young young age, especially when you're given that sort of power um, yeah. or access. Now, and then you went into Band of Brothers after that, right? Right. And now there was Band- some stuff in between, but there's sure. like a two year period where I was writing some other things. But then, yeah. So Band of Brothers, which is another monster hit for HBO, that thing is a, a legendary miniseries on. A band of brothers during World War II. This is before Private Ryan or after Private Ryan? It was after. You know, Tom, it kind of became a, a tradition for him. He made Apollo 13, <laughs> and then he decided to have a miniseries about the space program. Then he made Saving Private Ryan, and he and Steven, Steven Spielberg, I call him Steven, but to you, yes. it's Mr. Spielberg. Yes, yes, it's Mr. Spielberg. <laughs> they yes. decided to make Band of Brothers. First, yes. they were going to do something with Citizen Soldiers, which is another Stephen Ambrose book about World War II that was really just citizens who became soldiers from all over America. And then they wisely decided, you know, Band of Brothers is a more one group. We're going to mm-hmm. stay with this one group and follow their whole story. So it's a more contained uh, subject. And when working with uh, Mr. Spielberg, uh, how did you did you work with him? How was that process? And I imagine that that must have been overwhelming. Uh, just meeting him, or if you if you did meet with him and, and work yeah. with him on this, it must have been. It's Steven Spielberg, you know. I yeah. mean, it's, but you're you're sure. working with Tom Hanks, which is yeah. great. But now you're just like this is a whole other level of and different vi- flavor of of crazy. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't think I ever fully got over the that's Tom Hanks right there and we're in the same meeting. Like there's a certain like thing that never fully goes away. So uh yeah, so so Steven was uh was like there with Tom to kind of oversee like all the big decisions. He was he didn't direct any episodes, he wasn't like on set every day or anything like that. He would strategically come and visit or be involved in certain meetings, you know, looking at all the cuts and giving notes on the cuts. So I was Uh, You know, I had quite a few experiences where it was like a group of us in a meeting, including Stephen. And, you know, he was just like this infectious kid with this love for filmmaking who couldn't wait to tell you how they got that shot in Saving Private Ryan from like the steeple or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, like, here's what we did. You know, like it was he's just like uh, kind of similar to Tom in a way, kind of boyish, just uh, infectious enthusiasm um, uh, and love for love for the, the craft. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, certainly, uh, certainly a little overwhelming to be, you know, to be in his presence as well. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you were in many of those meetings, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. There were quite a few. Um, and I got to ride on a private jet once where it was just me and Tom and Steven from London to LA because uh-huh. we shot it all in the, in, in England. All right. Uh, and, uh, and that was pretty cool. Just the that, three of us, the three bros. That's just the three bros just chilling, <laughs> just hanging out, uh, you know, talking about stuff. <laughs> I would love to have been a fly in the wall on that, that plane. Yeah. Now, so can you give a one tip uh, that you would get? What is the one tip that you would give a writer that wants to break into TV and wants to can't try to get a TV gig? Wow, that's a, that's a big segue. Uh, the one tip um, – uh, <clears throat> 
Well, you know, keep at it. I mean, it's a persistence thing. That was a tip somebody gave me when I was first starting out, some established screenwriter, just like don't give up and keep doing it and keep learning as you go, getting feedback, learning and growing and understanding it's a marathon. And it's, uh, you know, it's rare to achieve something and to write something that would allow you to break in. Mm -hmm. And and uh, there's usually a long learning curve. Um and so you got to see it as an education and ongoing. I mean, I still feel like every script I'm writing, I'm learning and I'm I'm like a, a, a small child grappling in the dark with something that's beyond me. You know, it's always <laughs> that way and have this sort of open mind of I'm learning and I'm and I'm and I recognize that I am a uh, kind of a neophyte, maybe always mm-hmm. every new project. I'm a neophyte again and, and, and embrace that and just be about I'm going to learn and grow and improve. Now let's Never talk. Daily. Now yeah. let's talk about your book, the idea, the seven elements of a viable story screen for screen stage and or fiction. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you talk about the idea and what made you write the book? Yeah. So I've been uh, teaching screenwriting, coaching, and mentoring writers for the last ten years, as well as writing my own stuff and doing my own projects. And um, and what that's taught me. Is something I kind of already knew, but became even more clear, which is that it all lives or dies with the basic idea uh, that so much of what makes a project viable is contained within the basic premise you could pitch somebody in a paragraph or, you know, 30 seconds or whatever. And that most of the time we writers want to jump into the actual writing of the script without really vetting the idea, without spending enough time trying to arrive at an idea worth writing. And so when I give notes to a writer who sends me their scripts, like 90% plus of the most important notes I have on their script, the notes that most determine whether it's going to succeed or not are notes I would have had on that 30-second pitch if they told me the idea before they wrote any of the scenes or even outlined it or even did a sort of structure, you know, document. So, um, and also in my own career, like, there was a period where I was pitching ideas for series to the networks like drama series. And my agents would send me out to all these producers and studios and networks. And, and, and I would have to get, I, you know, get an idea for a series passed to them. First I had to get it past my agents, which was the hardest part almost because they were very tough on, um, you know, we're not going to send you out with some idea that we don't really believe in it. So I kind of had to learn for my own sort of making a living at that, what makes a viable idea it's become this like ongoing obsession. And so I kind of figured out based on as a writer, as, as a producer and as a coach and teacher, what makes an idea worth writing? Mm-hmm. What are really the elements? So, and I've been blogging about the craft for close to a decade now. And so some of this originated in my blog and was like, well, I really figured I, I really kind of worked it out that there's this acronym of seven elements using the word problem as the acronym, because every story is really about a problem that takes mm-hmm. the whole story to solve essentially. So the problem needs to have these seven characteristics and each one gets a chapter where I go into great depth on the pitfalls and how to make that element really come out in your work, whether it's film, TV, or, you know, I think it applies to fiction and other kinds of story as well. So what are the – do you mind telling us the seven key yeah. elements? Yeah. So it's punishing. Punishing relatable. problem. So it's a punishing problem? Uh, problem. Right. So P-R-O-B-L-E-M. So punishing, relatable. And, and these things describe not just the story but the problem at the heart of the story because mm-hmm. that's really what you're pitching when you're pitching a story. You're pitching a problem that takes the whole story to solve. So what does that problem have to look like? It has to be punishing to the main character which means it defies being solved. Mm -hmm. And even though they're actively trying to solve it throughout the story, mostly they're failing and they're losing and it's just getting more complicated and difficult and important all the way through. I liken it to watching your favorite sports team in a championship game where they're the underdog and they're behind. It's exciting to watch that. And hopefully they'll come from behind at the end and win the game at the final moment. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, there's a lot of things going wrong and you're on the edge of your seat. So it's punishing. The second one's relatable, which has to do with caring about the main character or characters and whatever the outcome of the story is that's that's in play. You want the audience to invest emotionally in that. It's not as easy to earn that investment as it might seem. Investment in both the main character, which most movies have a single main character. Uh, most TV episodes have multiple characters that get stories. Uh, investing in them and also investing in whatever it is they're trying to achieve or solve. The third is original. The fourth is believable, 
um, I should say just original. It's like fresh twist on a familiar genre is usually the way to go in my view, as opposed to I've got to do something totally different from how anyone's ever done anything before, which usually means you're not observing these other six elements because you're all focused on being different. So it's really about building on the shoulders of things that have worked, but with some intriguing fresh element you're bringing to it. Um, believable, that's obvious, but so many scripts and even premises for scripts fail when the audience is just like, eh, I don't know that I'd buy this. All right. I don't believe the people would do this or this situation that's very complicated and arbitrary that you've set up. And I'm not sure I am with you. So believability is a bigger one than it seems. The L is for life altering, which means the stakes of what's going on have to really matter. Uh, e is entertaining, which means don't forget your job really <laughs> is to bring your audience to some emotional state they paid to be in because they want this kind of genre to do something for them, whether it's action, comedy, romance, whatever. Uh, what is entertainment? How do you achieve entertainment? How do you make sure that's part of what you're doing? And then the last one is meaningful, which has to do with theme and making sure that what you're writing has some resonance beyond the surface events of your story. So people feel like, you know, you've kind of, it sticks to their ribs in terms of what it's really about and, and the human condition and, and life issues and challenges that we can all identify with. So in your, since you've been teaching so long and mentoring and, and, and you've obviously read a bunch of scripts over your course of your career, what is the biggest mistake you see first time screenwriters make? Um, well, when you're a first time screenwriter, you know, you're learning the craft. So there's a lot of things that you don't know how to do well yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we just talk on the concept level, I mean, the biggest mistake really is the one I already said, which is trying to jump too quickly into writing without vetting the concept. But if we put that one aside, uh, one of the really most common ones is issues with point of view. And that's covered in the relatable chapter, which means not understanding that you have to tell the story subjectively from the point of view of a character that the audience is meant to kind of become one with mm -hmm. almost like it's happening to them. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy to achieve. And there's specific practices and things to avoid in the achievement of that. And writers tend to either not realize that or not do that effectively. And so the first goal, I think, is, you know, you want to suck the reader into caring. And you usually do it through a specific individual character by by not telling it objectively, but telling it subjectively. And that's not just first time screenwriters, though. I mean, we all struggle with that, making the mm -hmm. audience care and and, and making them feel like they're inside the story is, you know, always important and often difficult. Now, can you name uh, a given example of a protagonist, an interesting protagonist, and why we connect with those that protagonist anywhere in cinema? Well, for some reason, Forrest Gump just <laughs> popped into my head. <laughs> I mean, you know, Michael Hague in his book, Writing Screenplays at Cell, sure. has this great section on empathy and the different techniques for gaining empathy. And a lot of it, when you really look at it, is a manipulation on the part of the writer, mm -hmm. a very conscious manipulation of giving a character certain elements that make you care about them. Save the Cat talked about they have to save a cat in the first right. 10 pages, which is kind of a joke, but it's actually true. They have to do something that makes us sympathize and feel like that's a good person. I like that person. You know, there's this real vo in vogue thing of unlikable main characters and anti heroes, and mm -hmm. people point to shows like Breaking Bad and say, look what a dark figure he was. And I always say, look at the pilot of Breaking Bad. And he was the yes. most lovable, relatable, yeah. average every man you could ever possibly meet who had all of these undeserved misfortunes, which is a phrase Michael Haig uses. When you give a character undeserved misfortune, like Forrest Gump didn't ask to be mentally handicapped and have those things on his legs and have people make fun of him. It's not fair. You immediately side with the poor, lovable, nice kid who's got these unfair things about his life. He didn't ask to not have a father. You know, he didn't ask to be picked on and chased. All these things that are just totally not fair. Uh, and in his simplicity, there's a goodness and a lovability that just makes you feel like he's your kid, like you just mm -hmm. want to protect him. Um, so, um, you know, the the, the uh, I forgot what I was going to say about the undeserved misfortune. But another another thing is when you put a character in jeopardy, so that so that we're worried about the character, which they do that with Forrest Gump as well. Um, and uh, Michael has this whole list of things that are really genius. Uh, that he's observed in movies over the years. But so much of the time you'll be reading a script and it's like, 
yeah, I don't have a strong pull to this person. I don't care. You know? Oh, I know what I was going to say. Breaking Bad, there are all these elements of undeserved misfortune. It's like he's a chemistry teacher who's passionate and good and his students couldn't care less. He doesn't make enough money, so he has to moonlight at a car wash where his students see him and make fun of him. Yep. He finds out he's dying. <laughs> he doesn't have enough money to leave his family after his death. This poor schmuck, right? <laughs> so you need to do all that for the audience to then accept when he starts cooking meth that, okay, this is his only option and we get why he's doing it and we still love him. And he's still in way over his head once he starts cooking meth, way over his head. You know, there's dangerous people everywhere and he's going to get arrested and it's like – Or killed. Takes, or, yeah, yeah. yeah, or killed. It takes a very long time for him to become the kind of like, you know, heavy, the kind of like top of his – Heisenberg. Game, scary Before. guy of Heisenberg, yeah. So I just think um, – it's a mistake to just say, oh, you can make your character really unlikable and it's fine. I don't even worry about it. It's not – you can't get away with that as easily as it, it might seem. So I'm always explaining to people, well, here this character that you think is unlikable in this thing that really worked. Let's look at all the things that actually make them likable. And usually there's quite a few of them that people didn't even notice. So, yeah, if you look at someone like uh, Wolverine or Logan you know, who is an anti-hero, quote unquote, there's things in his backstory that – you know, it's unfortunate. He didn't want, he didn't end up, he didn't want to become Wolverine. It was forced yeah. upon him. He lives in a constant cycle of always healing, not really aging. So he can live for hundreds of years and see people die. Like there's a lot of things that, if I'm like, if you go back to like even yeah. the vampire Lestat, you know, who's a very unlikable, he's a villain. He's a villain, but you, you kind of go with him a little bit and you see his, from his point of view, what, he has to go with. So even the most unlikable characters in, in history and in, in, in literature, they all have this kind of thing that you're talking about. Like Breaking Bad, I still say is one of the best series ever written or ever shot and ever created. It is just, it's perfection in my opinion. From the beginning, from the best pilot I've ever seen to the, one of the best endings I've ever seen and how they took that one beautiful, lovable guy and turned him into Heisenberg, who was, you know, Spoiler alert, a murderer, uh, egomaniacal maniac he turned him into, essentially. But there was always those little clips of, of, the, of the teacher, of the chemistry teacher, always sparkled in his eye every once in a while. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. And I would say the other key with, like, if somebody's unlikable, if you really pile the problems on top of them, yeah, really big yeah. problems, that makes a big difference because the audience can't help but relate to the character with the big problems. Like Scarface, pretty unlikable character, yeah. but he's got – He's facing death around every corner, essentially. Right. Uh, and if the character gets really beaten up by the events of the story, that helps you forgive unlikable qualities. But don't Especially forget life and death type stuff. Right. And also, don't forget where he came from, though. He was, you know, right. a refugee, well, all that. Little underdog. Yeah. Yes. Completely. Yeah. He saw his buddy killed with a chainsaw in front of him, you know, in that one scene. I mean, That's it's so like, good. yeah. It's insane. Now, on the other side of that, what is an amazing antagonist? And why do people like? Because because a lot of people write. I've read so many scripts. Horrible villains, and in movies, horrible antagonists. And I always use my favorite antagonist. One of my favorite cinematic antagonists of all time is the Joker in Dark Knight, who's just as perfect of an antagonist because he mirrored Batman in every way. He was the opposite, uh, you know. And I love that. What what is your what in your opinion? What makes a great antagonist and if you have an example of that well the, the you know, three-dimensionality you know that they're the human being that we can understand why they are the way they are and they're not they're not the same as every bad guy we've ever seen um they're not a one-dimensional mustache twirling you, villain you read my mind also, <laughs> right yeah but they're also not just the standard version of they're a villain who talks in a nice and cultured way like they're your friend but they're really you know, not, I mean, one that comes to mind is, you know, Christoph Waltz and in, Inglorious Bastards, oh, wow. right? Yeah. I mean, he, that opening sequence, oh. he's just, I mean, he is kind of, he is on one level, he is that version of pure evil pretending to be super friendly and have a sense of humor and be cultured and I'm working with you and we're friends, which we've seen a million times, but this, but this, that's where the, oh, and you know, the originality comes in the specific way he's written and the way he performs it Ugh. somehow transcends even that kind of – that cliche. It's terrifying. It was terrifying. Yeah. That, that seven-minute scene. It's what won him the Oscar. I don't believe that's first seven minutes. was like, well, that's just 
give it to him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there's, there's no, there's no, 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 um, question. And someone like Hannibal Lecter, who is an amazing anti hero, like you are literally rooting for a serial killer who eats people. <laughs> well, and I would point out he's not the antagonist in that movie. Right. He's the helper right. of the protagonist. Right. Um, and he's yeah he's super interesting. You understand <laughs> what he wants and what's in the way of that. So he kind of has his own story. But but I would say Buffalo Bill, sure. played by Ted Levine, who was the star of the first thing I ever wrote professionally, which was an episode of From the Earth to the Moon. He played uh, Alan Shepard. He's such a, he's uh, an amazing uh, actor. He, to me, Buffalo Bill is what makes that movie. People never talk about him, but those few scenes of him oh. being creepy alone are so real and feel so just like not like other serial killer things in movies where the because even Hannibal Lecter is kind of glamorized look at what a genius he is or whatever sure, which sure. I always find I mean Anthony Hopkins obviously transcended this but I always find that I don't love it when serial killers are portrayed as these like incredible geniuses that are outsmarting everybody um, somehow Buffalo Bill, yeah, he's outsmarting on one level. He knows how to like kidnap women and keep them hidden and all that stuff and not be found. But he's just this twisted sick guy. dude. Yeah, he's just a and sick. To soul. me, that felt very real, and and it made the threat feel very real. So whenever you cut to him, uh, to me, that you don't get to know him that well. But talk about an antagonist that just powers the whole movie. You just want to see that girl saved and. And you really believe in the reality of Buffalo Bill. She puts the lotion on the skin. Yeah. Now she gets the hose again. I mean, it's <laughs> – that was a brutal – I mean, it's a, such a brutal performance, wonderful performance. Uh, but then later on as the series continued, then the hero is Hannibal Lecter <laughs> in Hannibal and, oh, and right. Red Dragon and these kind of films, which is kind of like – what the heck? Like you're rooting for Syrica, like you're rooting for Scarface or you're rooting for uh, Heisenberg. And, and yeah. you're like, does that say something about me as a viewer? <laughs> or does that say something about the writer who wrote this? It's the manipulation that the writer is doing to make you see things through the perspective of somebody that you otherwise would recoil from and to give them problems mm-hmm. that you want to see them solve despite not liking certain things about what who they are. What what is your feeling on uh, the Joker? Like, how, if we could just dive in a little bit on that character, because I know I, I don't know what your feeling of of that movie is or of him, but I've always found him very interesting, and I think he's a great case study of what an antagonist should do for the protagonist. Yeah, I mean, Heath Ledger was amazing. I'm not a huge Dark Knight person myself, mm-hmm. which might be sacrilege to you and all what? of your listeners and viewers. That was a great interview. Thank it's you. Ex- it's a- <laughs> <laughs> it was a fantastic interview. It's actually not my genre. I'm actually more of a like romantic comedy type of guy, to believe it or yeah. not. I mean, people see Band of Brothers and they think, oh, high testosterone, guys with guns. He also writes about astronauts. So I was very much, you know, <laughs> after those two, people were always trying to put me on cop shows and stuff like that, which was the antithesis of who I am as a writer, what I aspire to be. So so uh, a lot of my favorite stuff doesn't have a villain, mm-hmm. doesn't have that antagonist, because not every genre or every kind of movie has to have sure. that straight up evil person with life and death stakes. Most of my favorite movies don't have life and death stakes. They have important life stakes, but it's not someone's going to kill me kind of stakes. Right. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to analyze the Joker or the Dark Knight too deeply is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So, OK, so then that's a good that's a good segue, though. So then uh, let's pick one of your favorite romantic comedies. And see what is the um, the conflict, and w- and how do we get to those those areas? Can we break that down a little bit? Sure. Well, forty year old virgin is a great yeah. one. Yeah, it is. Um, that you know, I think people think is great writing and was you know successful on every level. So we could talk about that if you wanted to. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, doesn't have a villain. You know, just has a guy who you fall in love with because he's got this really big problem. Um, he's a 40 year old virgin. (laughs) Well, the problem, and now everybody knows, (laughs) right? Like the catalyst of that movie is that they find out at the poker game that he's a virgin. And now he already had a problem, but now he has a pressing crisis problem, which I think all the great main characters have that, you know, in the beginning of the movie, he doesn't necessarily experience life as problematic prior to that moment. Right. He's just going along, living his compromised life without necessarily seeing it as compromised. 
you know, uh, Save the Cat talks about the main character should have six things that need fixing that we meet that we learn about in the setup or the first ten pages. So he's got all these things like you're sort of like looking at his life Spathetic. and you're going, wow, this is like, mm. uh, but he doesn't know it, right? No, he's and, happy. He's happy. Right. He's del- then this yeah. crisis happens. And then the whole rest of the movie is going to pu- push him and force him and pressure him in the most uncomfortable, under siege kind of way to fix those things that needed fixing that he didn't acknowledge, which means overcome your virginity and figure out love and relationships and, and move forward as an adult man who doesn't have life size Yodas sitting behind him. In his what? Studio. That's insane. <laughs> For everyone listening, I do have a life size Yoda. I have small Yodas. The other action figures I see as well. That would be a Wolverine and some Hulks in the background. I'm fine. I'm very comfortable. My, I'm very comfortable in my adulthood and in my own manhood, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know what? 30, 40 years ago, this would have been an issue. But now I'm just one of the guys. Right. Exactly. Well, do you see a Bill Maher's uh, new rule thing about Stan Lee? No. Let's- what is it? You know, he got in this big trouble because oh, yeah, yeah. he sits Stanley, on the bus, Stanley. Yeah. So he talked. So he talked about it on his show last week in his like new rules that he does at the end, and he really went after it about how people are, you know, people that are obsessed with like you know fanboy culture need to grow up and all that kind of stuff. And his he was like, he's like, <laughs> he said, I'm not, I'm not happy Stanley's dead. I'm upset that you're alive. <laughs> he's speaking to everybody who reveres comic books as as like high art and culture or whatever that's his point of view i'm not saying i agree with it it was funny it's just uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, since, yeah. since, since you brought yoda up i'm gonna have to defend yoda for a second i bought yoda in 1999 the conversation would not be as clean today with my wife and i said hey babe i need to buy a 500 hundred dollar life-size yoda Oh, I know the girls. I know my kids need, you know, summer school or, you know, or summer camp or after school. But like, right. that conversation is not being had today. Uh, same thing goes for all the statues in the back. There yeah. were different times. That have, there are artifacts of my earlier right. life I can't get rid of just yet. <laughs> you were smart to do that while you could because never again. <laughs> no, no. And just note for everyone listening, if you're going to buy a life-size Yoda or a giant – I have a giant alien egg too – um, if you're going to do things like that, do it when you're single or do yeah. it before the kids come. After yeah. that, it, the conversation changes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, back to what you were talking about as a yeah. 40 year old virgin. But he finally did finally leave. He did become uh, a man and had sex, you know, had, you know, had a relationship and sold his toys and built up a, you know, he, he just changed his life. But that's very interesting that so many writers don't understand that. It, the that the protagonist should not know that he or she needs to change, and then, yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Michael Haig is great on this too. I sound like I'm promoting Michael, who's my I, friend. My, Michael's, I, I'm, a, I'm great friends with Michael too, and he's Michael actually he's awesome. wrote a blurb on the back of my book that said something like, "Don't read any other screenwriting book, including mine, until you've read Eric Bork's The Idea." So this guy's a match. Well, you need but, to, so yeah, you, you need, you owe him at least a royalty or two. And, and we we team teach a class once in a while for this uh, screenwriting program in Sweden that we're both uh, kind of oh, nice. adjunct professors for. We do it online from mm-hmm. here, but anyway. Um, he talks about uh, – this is one of his big specialties is the whole character arc stuff. And he talks about how the main character most of the time in most movies is living in what he calls their, his identity instead of his essence. And his identity is this compromised version of himself that is the result of like childhood experiences and pain and issues that, that caused the character to become something that's a sort of limited, protected version of themselves that they project to the world, not their full best self. And they don't believe that full best self is possible. They don't even try to access it. They just are comfortable somewhat in that identity. He uses like the example in um, L.A. Confidential, Russell Crowe's character who saw his like mother beaten to death by his father while he was tied to a radiator or something like that. He says in this like bedroom scene with Kim Basinger and, you know, he always thought of himself as dumb and just as muscle. And that's how he's been treated. He's just a muscle guy. Uh, but he wants to be something more than that. And, and in the movie, thanks to the relationship with her, 
he starts to see the possibility of that because she believes in the essence, which is what a great love interest should do. They should see the essence. This is like just quoting Michael Haig right now. You might as well have him sitting here. (laughs) He's been on the show too many times. I can't keep bringing him back. (laughs) So so they see beyond the, he's probably said this already then they see beyond the identity and they see the essence and they help you become the person that you want to be. Or, you know, the, the, as Jerry Maguire, that line, I love the man. He, wants to be in the man he almost is oh so what know. a great line uh, oh yeah um no that's an amazing romantic comedy but yeah. it's not a, it's, it's kind of a romantic comedy but it has its own well flavor it, it's got two stories in one mm-hmm. and one is the story of jerry and his sports agenting problem his career and the second is the love story right so um i mean those are my favorite kind of movies usually aren't just about will these two people be together but there's something else one or both of them's trying to do that is it going to affect their future life? And that's really important and entertaining to watch as well. Um, so yeah, that's a great example of that. And the love story is kind of told more from her point of view, uh, which is interesting. Usually the main character, you know, that they have an a story problem, which is I lost my career and I'm trying to get it back. And then they have a B story. Often it's a relationship conflict or challenge, which is I've met this person, but there's a problem and is it going to work out or not? And while he has some scenes about his point of view of the relationship. There's more scenes of her point of view on the relationship, and you see that she has more to lose and more to gain. Mm -hmm. She's the one who we're seeing really is in love with him and wants him, whereas he's more like on the fence, can't really commit while his career's in upheaval, like men often are. And so um, I just think that's an interesting lesson when you start looking at A story and B story and point of view, um, that it flips how it's usually done where it gives the B story love interest kind of like the story from their point of view. So we're really telling two stories in one, which is often the case in romantic movies where you're kind of following both people in the couple and their life problems and point of view and what this relationship means to them, as opposed to movies that aren't about a romantic relationship. Primarily, you're usually only following one person Mm -hmm. and they might have a love interest as the B story, but we're always just with them. You know, Chris Pratt in Guardians of the Galaxy, he has this like minor B story love interest with, you know, Zoe Saldana, mm-hmm. um, but it's all from his point of view. It's never from her point of view. Right. You never hear her, how she feels about any of that. Um, and did, uh, on a Jerry Maguire uh, note, yeah. did you know about Jerry Maguire's, uh, did you ever visit the Jerry Maguire video store in LA? What is that? No. There was a, there was an installation done. This is, these guys are insane. They're VHS heads. Like they just, all, all they do is collect old VHSs. And they collected, they have the world record for collecting every Jerry Maguire VHS they could get their hands on. And they built a video store out of Jerry Maguire VHSs. And the only thing you could rent or buy is Jerry Maguire VHSs. And then after the installation, they're like, well, what are we going to do with all these Jerry Maguire VHSs? They're building a pyramid in the desert somewhere out of, I'm not joking. I've seen this. It, they're, they're trying to get like, the the right like it's all being crowdfunded, so they're like getting the money and they're like having an uh, an actual architect h- how they're gonna do it, how they're gonna seal it, and they're gonna build like this pyramid where you can walk into the to the temple of Jerry Maguire, all made out of Jerry Maguire VHSs. It's baffling. Now, is this an irony thing, or are they true fans of the movie? No, I think it's an. I think it's. I, I think it's a. Well, they obviously they're fans of the movie. I mean, you know, who isn't? If you, if you don't like Jerry Maguire, you're dead inside. But um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, it's, I agree. There's like Shawshank Redemption. You don't like Shawshank Redemption, you're dead inside. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't talk to you. But do you like Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> we can continue this conversation then. No, but I think it's a little bit of both. They're trying to do like an artistic irony to like a message or uh, or statement. But they yeah. are, like they've said very much, we love Jerry Maguire. Not, it's not like we live Jerry Maguire, but we just thought that's – wouldn't it be amazing to have a video store that was just built out of Jerry Maguire VHS? That's so bizarre. I got to look that up. I think I have a Jerry Maguire VHS. I it, think I also have – Oh, no, like, and people would send them. People would uh, – yeah. they put the word out and people would yeah, send them from everywhere around the world. They would just send boxes of Jerry Maguire VHS because uh-huh. there's only so many thrift shops in L.A. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that you could get them from. So he got them, they got them from internationally. It was, it's, it's an insane process project, but anyway, I just thought that would be a nice antidote. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to look that up when we're done here. You see, you learn something. See pictures. You learn so. something new every day. I totally, uh, <laughs> totally did. Now, what is one thing? And I know you probably get this question a lot. And since you are a screenwriter in, in Hollywood and and have had you know success as a screenwriter, what do screenwriters do to stand out of the crowd? Because there's so much more competition. Even when you were doing From Earth to the Moon, it's a massive different business than it was then. Well, I mean, I'll say something that um, buyers will often say, like producers, when you're pitching something or like executives at studio or network or whatever, which is that they love it when a writer comes in with something that only they could have written. Right. That's really their voice, their personal obsession in some way. Now, not every script can be 100 percent your personal obsession. How many personal obsessions do we all have? But your particular point of view on the world and on the story and the characters that is different from how anyone else would have done it. I mean, it takes time to cultivate a voice. And that's really like at a mastery level when you have that kind of voice that people go, wow, that's, you know, that's, um, that's Charlie Shane Black. Kaufman. That's Jan- yeah, Charlie Black. Kaufman or, you know, Tarantino, um, yeah. Tarantino, Woody Allen, you know, yeah. you, I mean, Sorkin, um, right. yeah, Sorkin for sure. Yeah. It's so it's like cultivating who you uniquely are. So that what you're doing isn't trying to stand out. It's just being organically you as a unique individual that's unlike anyone else and any other writer. And you're applying that to whatever you're writing. There, and, that is a, and that is a rarity. If you start thinking about how many writers can we name off the top of our head, that their writing style is so distinctive just by like you read a few lines and you're like, oh, that's a Tarantino script. Or that's a Sorkin script, or that's a Shane Black script, or that's a Ka- Kaufman script, uh, or a Woody yeah. Allen script. Like the, they're just so specific. And I, don't, I don't know that it needs to be so distinctive that anyone could tell right away, but it's just like I mean Vince Gilligan, same thing. Yeah, yeah. he's got a very particular voice. He had on the X Files. He had he had on Breaking Bad, and and so it doesn't have to be so crazy specific that you're like no other writer on earth. It just has to be you fully you. And if you're fully you, you're going to be unique. And if you fully can somehow follow what interests you and what you think is good, I believe that's the path to standing out rather than trying to sort of like game the system and make yourself. I mean, certainly there's marketing tricks and people like, you know, get scripts to people in weird ways or whatever. But in terms of the work actually holding up and staying on its own, that's what I would say. Yeah. I, I always tell people that if you, if you are yourself, there is no competition, yeah, because you can't compete against. You just can't. <laughs> it's just. I mean, I'll never be Kaufman. I'll never write yeah. like Sorkin. That's that. And as much as you try to be them, you're never going to out Sorkin. Sorkin. Yeah, <laughs> you're never. Well, out- doesn't need two of them anyway. <laughs> exactly. They need one of you. <laughs> exactly. Now, real quick, what? Any advice on pitching? Because you've been in a couple pitches. I'm assuming in life. <laughs> Quite a few. Yeah. Any advice? Um, well, one of the things that, that, uh, that you're always told when you're pitching that is similar to what I just said is that you want to start with why you, why this? Mm-hmm. What is your personal experience? And the more you have an anecdote that's its own story from your own life that is engaging to people and gets them starting to be on your side, almost like you want them on your main character side, as the writer who came to this and wanted to do this for certain reasons – that's a great way to begin. And that's part of how you establish that only you could have written this the way you're writing this. And you have reasons for doing so that come from somewhere really genuine within you. So that's, if you want one thing, that's certainly one thing. <laughs> but another thing I would say is like, what's really hard for writers often is to learn to look at their story and their basic idea for their story from kind of 30,000 feet zoomed way out mm-hmm. or just the concept level or like the log line level. When you're pitching Unless you're really in a formal pitch setting where someone's going to sit there in an office and let you have 15 minutes, any other situation, you're going to bore people to death and irritate them if you try to explain your whole movie and go into great detail about everything that happens. And writers often make that mistake. Nobody wants to hear that. At most, (laughs) they might want just the basic concept like a log line. And then if from the log line they go, oh, well, that's interesting. Tell me more about whatever. Then you're free to go further. But – 
writers tend to bore and alienate people a lot on the business side. <laughs> if like you're at a panel and you're talking to some producer or manager, if you go up and say, hi, I have this script and this about this and this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens and then this happens and the reason they do this is because blah, 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 blah. The person is just like someone shoot me in the head while they're listening to that. They, you know, it's uninvited sort of like pitch rape, you know, <laughs> like you just want to avoid doing that. <laughs> I am so going to steal that, my friend. I apologize. I'm telling you right now. Go ahead. I just pitch rape. My head. I don't think it's very appropriate thing to say, but it it's, is kind a- of like, it's sort of like that. You're just, why are you pitch, making pitch violation, or, pitch violation yeah, <laughs> and, and act interested in this thing that I have, you have, you know, but I understand because writers are desperate and they want to like, they just think if they talk about their story to the right person, right. they hear all the cool details, that person's going to love it, but it doesn't really tend to work that way. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests, okay. uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Um, I think of things that I haven't said already. Um, you can review. Um, um, we talked about TV a little bit. We talked about film. Um, I guess, you know, don't expect a white knight who's going to make it all happen for you. (laughs) And this probably fits your ethos. Uh, Calvary, the Calvary is not coming. Yeah, and just be be about, you know, be about – it's kind of counterintuitive in a way, but it's like writers who focus all on the marketing and the trying to get their stuff to the right people, it, it's, it's a frustrating truth that you're probably not going to ever find them, mm-hmm. but they will find you when the work is ready. But when the work is ready, you're not desperate for them anymore because somehow you've just gotten to a place where – the whole gestalt of you and your writing has elevated to a level that it's the next logical step. Like everything that happened in my career was the next logical step from where I was just prior to that. It wasn't like some, even though like Tom Hanks gave me that big promotion, which was a huge thing, but a lot of things happened on the way to that. And a a lot of that was in my own kind of consciousness and my own building up of self-belief, which came from doing a lot of work, getting a lot of feedback, doing all the things that you do as a writer to you know learn and grow and get your stuff out there um but mostly failing you know so i understand that it's a failure process like you're mostly going to have rejection and failure and people that have no interest in you (laughs) and um try not to get bitter and blame those people and have more of an attitude of i'm just going to be always learning and growing and it's about the work and what it's really about is the audience Mm -hmm. The work I'm doing is supposed to delight an audience. So how do I serve them as opposed to how do I get served by an industry that seems to not care about me? Mm-hmm. The more you focus on what you're giving, the more you're going to create stuff that actually people will then want, like any business. That's amazing. And also in life, the more you give, yeah. the more you receive. Right. Yeah. Very, very cool. Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Um, probably the catcher in the rye. It's been on the show many times. I'm sure. <laughs> what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Ooh, good one. Uh, well, it's probably the one that I just said, cause I think, I feel like I'm still having to try to learn every day. The whole idea of don't be about what you can get, be about what you can give and be kind of sort of selfless in that way. It's like a daily challenge. Mm-hmm. Fair, especially in this business. <laughs> yeah. And the War of Art is a great book, oh, by the way. Oh, That's yeah. If I come up before too here uh, about you know how to get the right mindset about you know what you're doing and how to fight through resistance, or transcend the part of you yeah. that doesn't want to do the work and doesn't believe in it. I did an entire episode on the War of Art because it was okay. such an amazing. It, it's really an amazing book, and Stephen, I couldn't get Stephen on the show, but he sent me. I think boxes of books to give away to my audience, like insane amounts of books that he gave away. That's all of cool. his books, all of his books. And he's yeah, yeah, that one and then do the work, which is another great one. The sequel, I think, to War of Art. We had two wasn't it Turning Pro? Turning Pro and then was Do the, the sequ- Work. And then Do the Work. Okay. I haven't yeah. read Do the Work, but I read Turning Pro. Yeah, Turning Pro was another great one. And then the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. The World According to Garp. Great movie. Um, I'm trying to think of ones that I haven't said already. Well, The Godfather, mm-hmm. um, and um, Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. <laughs> That's 
great movie. In the top 20 for sure. It's awesome. And <laughs> and and to go back to finish it off the book and the, the interview with with Tom again. I remember watching Tom uh Tom Hanks talk about Godfather and how all problems in life can be solved by watching The Godfather. All the answers to life are in The Godfather. If you have a deep problem uh-huh. Watch The Godfather, the answer will appear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I ever heard him say that. That's funny, though. It does I saw sound the, like something he would say. I saw it in the like one of the behind the scenes documentaries on The Godfather, yeah. like the 30th or the 40th anniversary, whatever it was. Uh, and then, where can people find you and your book, uh, The Idea? Yeah. So, the book is on Amazon. I have a website that has info about the book and all of my coaching and consulting and a million blog posts that are, that are helpful for writers. It's called Flying Wrestler. And why? So flying wrestler.com. Well, back to world according to Garp. When I was looking for a uh, sort of like, I don't know why I just wanted like some catchy name for my blog rather than just Eric Bork's blog or some kind of like screenwriting advice.com or whatever. Um, uh, and, um, that movie was a real inspiration to me. I was a teenager and I saw it in a theater and it kind of changed my trajectory in, in, in life in a way, as far as wanting to be a writer and even a screenwriter. Um, and it's about a wrestler who's, who's obsessed with flying. But I also thought that that was a kind of metaphor for writing that you're, there's a transcendent quality that there can be where you're like flying, but there's also a wrestling with the material, like a day to day sort of struggle and wrestle. So I like the sort of oppositeness of that and how they're both contained in one thing. It's a very, it's very deep, sir. It's very deep. Thank you. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to the tribe today. I truly appreciate it, man. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Totally my pleasure. I want to thank Eric for coming on and sharing his time, his experience, and his knowledge with the tribe today. If you want links to his any of his books or things that he's talking about, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS038. And if you haven't already, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash mob and buy my new book, Shooting for the Mob, the story of how I was a 26-year-old film director hired to direct a $20 million feature film for a mobster, and it was crazy. And the story's nuts, and I go to Hollywood. I meet big producers, actors, as well as uh, deal with a bipolar, egomaniacal gangster uh, as a producer slash subject of the movie. So it was really crazy. So if you want to take a read of it, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash mob. And that's it for another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y dot com.